Well, welcome to chapter 12. In chapter 12, we're going to learn the word I'll toss. Now, you've already met this word, and you've used it in certain situations. And so this is a chapter where we're going to kind of spell out the full use of the word I'll toss. You've learned it as one function, namely the personal pronoun. What we're going to find is that I'll toss actually has three distinct functions. But first of all, as far as the form is concerned, it's a straightforward 212 adjective. So there's no surprises in the actual form, except that you'll notice something in the neuter. What's missing? The new. There is a sub-pattern in second declension neuters that drop the new in the nominative and the accusative singular. And I'll toss is one of those. Now that's cool because when you see auton, you know that it has to be accusative singular masculine. But in the neuter, it's auta with an omicron. And you notice, though, that unlike ego and su, first and second person, that in the third person, we do have gender. So you have altas, alte, alta. And when this word is referring back to a person, the word follows natural gender, doesn't it? If it's altas, it's a he or a generic. If it's alte, it's she. But you may have noticed that if the antecedent to this word is not a person, then the word does not follow natural gender, it follows grammatical gender. In other words, let's say the antecedent of the word is cosmos. And then later on in the sentence, you want to refer back to cosmos. Which form of the word are you going to use? You're going to use the masculine, but you're not going to translate autos as he because the antecedent is cosmos, world, which in English we refer to as an it. When the antecedent of autos is a person, it follows natural gender. When the antecedent is not a person, it follows grammatical gender. And you have to be pretty careful at how you translate that word. Once we get into the plural of autos, you notice a difference between Greek and English. In Greek, we still have gender. In English, we don't. In other words, we say they, whether it's a group of men or a group of women or mixed. But Greek will maintain its gender differentiation in the plural, and the same rules apply to the plural that we use in the singular. So you have to look at it, say, is it referring to a person or not? Is it following natural gender or grammatical gender? Although we have learned autos as a third-person personal pronoun, it technically should be stated that autos has three functions. The first and most common function of autos is, as you might expect, as the third-person personal pronoun. This is the use that you've used so far. And so if you say autos legi auto, we're going to translate it, he says to him. How is the case of altos determined when it's functioning as a personal pronoun? It's function in the sentence. So altos is nominative because it's acting as a subject. It's gender and number are determined by what it stands for, right? Either natural gender or grammatical gender. So if we say altoi legusin alte, we would translate it, they say to her, and again, if you have cosmos, then later on want to refer back to it, it'll be autos, it'll be masculine, but we would translate the masculine autos as it because it's referring back to cosmos. All you have to do is think, okay, what does the Greek mean? And then how do I say that in English? It's pretty straightforward. Autos also, though, can function as what we call an adjectival intensive. And these are generally translated with the English reflexive. Autos ha apostolos would be translated the apostle himself. Aute he ecclesia would be the church itself. So the second use of autos is as an adjectival intensive. And basically, this is what happens when you find autos 
in a predicate position with the nominative. And it's just a way the Greek has to emphasize normally the subject, but a way to emphasize a particular word. Now, what's going to determine the case number and gender of altos when it's functioning as an adjectival intensive? Yeah, again, nothing new to learn. This is just straightforward grammar. It's just an adjective in this case. And its case number and gender is determined by the word that it modifies. How would you translate ego altos? Right. I, myself. In other words, all you do is you look at the word that it modifies and then figure which of the English reflexive pronouns would make sense. So it's the apostle himself, the church itself, the gift itself, I, myself. Just common sense English, okay? Altas has to be in the predicate position to be functioning as an adjectival intensive. So as long as it's in a predicate position, so you can have ha apostolos altas. And again, what you have to do is look at the sentence and say, would that be translated, the apostle is, in other words, is it in the predicate position and you supply is, or is it functioning as an adjectival intensive? It's actually pretty straightforward because it's almost always nominative, almost always up near the front of the sentence. And you'll see these things and they'll stand out and go, oh, of course. The third use of altas is as what we call the identical adjective. And this is when you translate altos with the word same. It's very straightforward. When you see altos in an attributive position, it is usually functioning as the identical adjective. And so ha altos iesus, see altos is in the attributive position. It's immediately preceded by the article. And so that's translated the same Jesus. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but you'll get the idea. The same Jesus says, ton alton lagon, again you have alton in an attributive position, and therefore it says the same word. So there's your three functions of altas, as a personal pronoun, and that's what you're used to, and the vast majority of the New Testament uses of altas is as a personal pronoun. But when you see it in a predicate position, it can be functioning as the intensifier. And if you see it in the attributive position, it can be functioning as the identical. And just kind of use common sense in your translation.